Hey folks, we've got a doozy of a detail review and it is Underwater Cities from Vladimir Suchi. Now, Vladimir Suchi is the same bloke who did Pulsar 2849. If you've been paying attention to recent videos, you will know that's one of the point salad games that's super dry, super mechanical, that for some reason I like. Don't ask me why that transformation happened with that particular game. Probably because it's very streamlined, it gives you a lot of options, but maybe it's mostly that. I mean, I like dice placement anyway, and more variety is good. Yes, it's a complete dry point salad, but there's just something about it. Streamlined mechanics work. Take note, publishers. So when I heard that he was doing a heavier Euro game for Underwater Cities, I was like, ooh, okay, more stuff from him. This will be good. Hang on a minute, heavier? And then I started learning that it was like a good three hour game. It was pretty heavy, quite brain burning, uh, was still gonna be relatively super dry, you know, mostly just mechanics. And it's like, I don't know, you hit once with Pulsar 2849, but I don't know if you're gonna hit it twice. With underwater cities, you are building, uh, well, literally underwater cities. I mean, it's in the title, come on. And of course, the objective is to have the most victory points. Of course! And to accomplish this, you are building cities and tunnels underwater. And in these cities, you get to build little buildings like labs and farms and desalination plants. Is that how you pronounce it? The stuff that takes salt out of water. And you're doing this by a very interesting mechanic of cards. The card, yeah, I mean, come on, what, cards, you know, that's nothing. Well, hear me out here. It's kind of card worker placement in a sense. You have several slots on the board, four or five slots per color, green, red, and yellow. The idea being that you will play a card on one of these slots to trigger a location action. But if you can play a card of the same color as the action, as the location that you're going to, you get to trigger not only the location action, but also the card action. So you want to be as efficient as you can and get the most actions, the most benefits and bonuses throughout the whole game. In playing these cards, you will do things like adjust turn order, build cities, produce resources, uh, make tunnels, uh, upgrade buildings, you know, collect more cards, you know, do you want more cards off the deck, which are, you know, they chop and change in three different phases of the game, or do you want some special cards that are, you know, you don't know which ones are going to appear each game, and six of them are completely random out of a selection of end game scoring cards. It's very much a hand management slash tableau management building game. Yeah, of course, you're building like little city domes and little tunnels and little bead cities on this little player board map in front of you. But when all things said and done, theme's not the strongest element of this game. It's more the mechanics of those cards. It is the bread and butter of this game. You carry on through three eras. You play a certain amount of rounds, then have a bit of a scoring and production phase, then another round, same again, then another round, same again, and some end game scoring occurs. So it's, you know, it's on rails in terms of the rounds. You know when it's going to end. There's no surprise ending here. But throughout that, it's all about playing those cards and having that limitation of only four cards in your tableau in front of you play out a lot during the game. Of course, you know, does it, can he, can he do it twice? You know, can lightning strike twice on this occasion? Let's look at it in more detail. Duration is, it depends on your perspective. It's a weak point for me, but not quite as bad as I've seen in other games. It depends, again, on what your tolerance level is. This is a long game. Full stop. Fact. End of discussion. It's long. The box says 40 minutes per snorkel. Okay, per player, but I like the symbol it uses on it. And okay, 40 minutes per player is on average what you're gonna do, actually. <laughs> this is pretty accurate. You know, you will at best be able to do 30 minutes a player if all of you know what you're doing and you don't have to check the rules and you don't have to teach the game. 30 minutes a player, <laughs> like I say, golden scenario but let's go back to the real world here and suggest that you're teaching new players or you have the occasional slowish one or you have to look up the rule book every now and again or you might have to teach it or people just want to actually talk during a game and you are looking at about 40 to 45 minutes a player so you will play this solo and chances are it will take you about an hour and you know hour tops and then two players, somewhere around the 90 minute mark, three players easily looking around the two hour, two and a bit mark, two and a quarter, two and a half tops, and four players, whew, 
Four players can be anything from like two hours if you really are in that golden scenario to anything like three to three and a half hours. I have heard tales of people taking four hours plus with this game. That's a bit extreme, I'll admit. Uh, longest I've had was three and a bit hours with four players, but there wasn't that many new players in there and I was already used to the game at that point. So it's definitely long, <laughs> except that. And as far as I can tell, for two and three player, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's it's decent enough. It you know you're engaged between turns. More on that a bit later. But you don't feel that there's too much downtime. Yes, you got to wait for your turn to get back round. But there's plenty enough for you to think about on your turn. Particularly as this is more of a tactical than a strategic game. Again, more on that later. Four players though. Ugh. You're engaged, but four players is just that step too much. This isn't a game that really needs to take three hours. It doesn't need to be that long, but it does well at a two to two and a half hour mark. So four players is very dependent on who you're playing the game with. And I know you can say that about a lot of games, but with this one especially, you are looking at a two and a half plus hour game with this. And I feel that you don't get enough interaction with other players to warrant that length. This is mostly a multiplayer solitaire game. Yes, you can get blocked out of locations, but that is no different than any other worker placement game. There's no cards that interact with the other players. You cannot go and destroy their base. You can't go infiltrate their base or anything like that. It's purely a case of who took the space or the objective before you did. So for the most part, it's multiplayer solitaire. Does it need to have that many players? Does it need to have that long a time length? So it's not too bad. I have played a lot worse <laughs> for games taking far too long. Don't tell me, Mars. Um, but you know, for the what it is, it's just about enough engagement to not overstay its welcome. <laughs> well, without four players, anyway. For ease of play, this is a heavy game, guys. Come on. Some people have tried to claim it's like midweight. I'm sorry, games like Viticulture are midweight and they're still fairly involved. There's a you know, you have to play at least once or twice to get the hang of it, but it's not too complex. That's more midweight Euro. This is heavy. I mean, you know, you've got to contemplate, you know, what cards you've got in your hand, what cards are, you know, what spaces are available, you know, what resources you need, the feeding of your people. The, you know, the four cards in your tableau, you know, are some of them actions that need to be triggered. There's a special card there. Do I want to grab it now before someone else does? Do I have the, you know, uh, the objectives if you choose to play with them? Can I meet one of those? How long is it going to take me to build a city so I can get points before the era finishes? You know, there's a lot to take in. And thankfully, the rulebook does a good job of helping you out with this. This is a very good rule book. There are one or two ambiguous parts in it, but nothing too bad, you know, nothing too, that you couldn't sort of figure out with a quick FAQ look, or certainly with just maybe a little bit of common sense now that I think about it. But the rule book's fairly well laid out. It's logical. It's in the right order as in terms of steps that you should learn. It's fairly clear written. And there's a lot of pictorial examples, good pictorial examples, not just a tiny little screenshot. No, proper examples of how things like construction works, how the network, what your network is made up of. And trust me, that takes a little bit to get your head around, you know, what's connected and what isn't. But again, there's pictorial examples. There's a good setup diagram. There's good diagrams for the cards. Basically, you should be able to pick up this game with relative ease if you are used to this weight game already. People compare this to Terraforming Mars, it's got similarities, but I don't think they're quite the same game. But certainly, if you're used to a game of that weight, you know, Terraforming Mars type weight, you're going to get into this without too much trouble. Do not stick this in front of a new player, though, or even a next step game. It is way too much out there. I mean, if they were blown away by the likes of Pulsar 2849, for example, this will melt their brain. It's just not going to work. You know, this is definitely a gamer's game. I wouldn't want to put anyone remotely AP in this game because, oh my god. God, <laughs> if somebody is, if somebody plays this game who is normally AP, I will happily open the lock. Is it an airlock when it's underwater? I don't know. <laughs> so, but either way, I would just drown them outside before I'd let them play this game because it's not a game that you want to have your analysis paralysis prone player here because there's a lot of options, a lot of choices to make, a lot of decision making throughout and it's very tactical, which means that a lot of the time you kind of have to think on the fly a bit. AP players will kill this game. This is not for them at all. But 
Like I say, good rule book, heavy weight, not for newbies, not for the slow, but it's, but like I say, I expected this to be a lot harder to get into and I found that with the aid of that rule book, well, wasn't actually too bad. Tactics and strategy. Now this is where this game starts to shine a bit more because this isn't a strategic game. You can't really play this in a strategic kind of way. You might think, well, you know, this time I'm going to uh, munchkin on farms or I'm going to munchkin on labs or I'm going to go around and get those free metropoli or I'm going to maybe just build a ton of tunnels, build a ton of cities. Maybe I'll just stay in two or three cities and really build them up. I don't know. You can't really do that, though, because like Terraforming Mars, I know I make the comparisons, but there are similarities. You know, Terraforming Mars gets a little bit flat, well, for me anyway, everybody else seems to ignore this fact, that it has a bit of luck involved. doesn't matter if you draft the cards, you're still drawing from this giant deck of cards, and you might have a corp that says, ooh, I, uh, I get to bonuses and that when I make trees, right, I'm going to make trees this game, and you never see any tree cards. It happens a lot. So there's that element there. It's the same here though. You are drawing from a deck of cards. You draw one every turn. You could draw more cards with actions, but again, you are drawing from a deck of cards and you may find cards that are good for what you wanted to do and some that are pretty rubbish. And it's not like they give you a lot of choice on those cards. They're either good or they're bad. There's not really much middle ground here. So you can't really do a strategy throughout. You have to think tactically because you could be thinking, right, well, let's see, uh, if I play that now, I can get that bonus, which could be used to do that one, fine. All right, draw another card. Oh, that's pretty sweet. You know what? Maybe that can wait. If I do that one first, you know, um, let's see, that action card in front of me, I've, I will trigger it now. Good, got the bonus. Do I really need it again? Can I be bothered to wait until the era finishes before I channel it up? Okay, uh, maybe I will uh, play this action card over here, claim it and replace that card with that one. It's done its job. There's a lot of that. You have to really be capable of thinking on the fly. You need a plan, you need a backup plan, and you need a backup plan to the backup plan. <laughs> because if people take your spot, which frequently happens, particularly in free and four player, you're gonna need some other ideas. And sometimes you will just get blocked out of a location for the round and you really want to go there and it's like, well, if that don't work, what's the next best thing I really need to get a move on with? So there's definitely more tactics and strategy, but it's engaging. I mentioned with the duration that it's a long game, but the fact that you have to think tactically means that you are engaged for the most part between turns. You'll get times where, you know, you can't really think too far ahead because the game board state might change by the time it gets around to you. And in four players, that really does happen. But, you know, you can at least be thinking, right, well, that's good, that's good, all right, it's on their turn, but still good for that. But just in case she might take that space, I'm going to keep this other one in mind. You know, but occasionally it may just get back around to your turn and suddenly it's like, well, you just screwed up my plan and you screwed up my backup plan. So, uh, hmm, uh, give me a second quick, you know, and you've got to think of something else. you got to be quick about it. Uh, but it will keep you engaged. You're not often going to be sitting there going, come on, guys, come on, I'm waiting. You know, four players, you probably will be. But two to three players, no, not so much. You're going to be involved. It's fun to play those card combos. And, you know, the, the main aspect of this game, the card play with the tac with the, the location spaces and trying to match the colors, is also the best part of this game. You know, trying to come up with cool combos, trying to make the most of all these cards. It's never satisfying to just go, oh, well, there's a card. I'll just do two resources from that location, unless you're desperate for that location action. It's much more fun to be able to go, Ooh, I could play that red over there and then get this and this. And then I'll play the yellow over here and get this and this. You know, I, I always want to trigger as many bonuses as I can. Granted, that doesn't always mean that I'm playing the best move because I might be trying to get too many bonuses when actually I just needed this one key thing. You've got to chop and change and know when to pick your battles and when, you know, when to hold them, when to fold them. Uh, but yeah, it's engaging, very tactical, and I like it. You know, the card play in this is great fun. Just like the dice in Pulsar were great fun, the cards in this one are great fun. Certainly for me, more entertaining than the draft in Terraforming Mars and similar, similar games like that. I just think there's something about trying to create those combos that's more satisfying than just simply picking a card. But, you know, strokes for folks. So far, looking good. Aesthetics, this takes a little bit more of a nosedive. Well, not, not too far, maybe shallow waters. You know, it certainly is pretty. 
in terms of color. You've got bright blue, no, blue, sorry. You've got blues everywhere because it is underwater after all, but you've also got the bright green, yellow, and red of the cards and on the board. It is littered with iconography, like a ton, but thankfully there's text on the cards, so if you don't understand the iconography, you can always just read the text. Good, I like it when games do that, kudos. But it's not entirely great component quality wise. I think it looks nice. I mean, there's nothing much on here to go, oh, this is fantastic artwork. It's a pretty basic map of the world, and your player board is just some basic, like, water effects now. And like I say, it looks good. And the artwork on the cards themselves, again, it looks nice. It looks colourful and vibrant. But the cards themselves are not the best quality. They're quite thin. And you're going to be using these a lot. You know, putting them on the tableau, putting them on the locations, picking them up, shuffling them around, drawing them from a deck, shuffling other decks... There's a lot of card draw, card manipulation. The cards will wear and tear if you're not careful. You really ought to sleeve these, and it's going to probably cost you about a tenner in premium sleeves in order to sleeve as many cards as there are in this game, and then find a way to store them and stack them on the board so they don't slide around everywhere. It's, it's all that, but I do recommend you sleeve the cards in this game, though. I mean, I'm already, like, collating together an order when I need to start getting some more sleeves for this. Until then, I'm like, oh, don't bend the card too much, please. No, it's, uh, it's kind of worrisome. On top of that, you know, the domes are okay. They're just little plasticky domes, but they look the part. The tunnels are just a little bit of cardboard chits, and so is everything else. Resource chits. Chits, we're in 2019, people. Can we not do better than cardboard chits? But, you know, they, they look okay, but there's nothing particularly special about them. And there really isn't enough in the box. I mean, you're, you're constantly having to change up ones to freeze and everything, especially when you get to the third era of this game where production is so insane and off the charts that you're producing things a lot faster than you can physically use them. And so there isn't enough components in the box to favor three or four players. It's pretty annoying at times. And then on top of that, you've got the building little beads, these tiny little circles, little circle discs or plastic discs. And fair enough, they look nice. Except they're very small, very small. You have to put them on this little space next to the domes. There's three spots, four if you expand it, and one on its own is fine. But then you stack two in order to have an upgraded version. And then you do this multiple times throughout the game. And so one little nudge and suddenly these beads are all over the place. And then you're trying to stack them up again. And because you've got the domes and everything else in the way, you're basically having to play tweezers with your fat fingers in order to get these beads to balance on top of these things. Anybody with OCD is going to have a field day with these when they're slightly out of sync with each other. You know, so it's okay. Uh, certainly the colors and the art gets me more into this than the the, the whole like, component quality side. I feel that a deluxe version would have been better, maybe like just an upgrade in the component quality. There's already people on Etsy doing different components for the chits and that, which, okay, it's kind of horrible looking plastic, but again, it looks better than the cardboard chit. So it's kind of a, hmm, in the meh region for aesthetics. Now the best thing with this game is that the thematic immersion is top-notch, gorgeous, and dripping with theme. Yeah, in your bra. Okay, that was a lie. You know, it's basically the whole Pulsar 2849 argument. Pulsar 2849 was meant to be all spacey, it kind of looked it, but theme-wise, who gave a monkeys? It really just had nothing to do with the theme. This is pretty much the same deal, really. I mean, you could feed your people with bread, wheat, or kelp. What does it matter, depending on what setting you choose? Yeah, you got the little domes that look like underwater domes, but aside from that, you kind of half the time forget you're actually underwater, you know, because you're building labs, you're building farms, you're building like the desalination plants, so you pronounce it, but at the end of the day, it could just be a subway network of tunnels for all it matters. It could be a subterranean network you're building. You could easily change this from underwater to some other type of underground or in space type setting. And the card play really has nothing to do with what you're doing with building underwater cities. Like, why am I playing colors on colors and creating combos to build resources, to build upgrade cities? How's that work? You know, there is no thematic time with this game. This is bone dry. And for the most part, it doesn't matter too much. I mean, like I say, I liked Pulsar 2849 despite the fact it has no theme. Theme does not instantly make the game good. It just makes me come back more often for it because I want to get immersed in that theme. 
Here, the setting is cool. I mean, I like the whole idea of building an underwater city network. I don't know of many games that do that. And I feel like it's something that could be explored more. No pun intended. But, yeah, it's like, whatever. I've got cards. I've got resources. I don't care if one's called kelp or antimatter or whatever. It's like, I'm playing cards and doing cool stuff with that. The fact that we're underwater in a city thematically is pretty much just lobbed, <laughs> lobbed across the ocean and never to be seen again. So do not go into this game thinking you're going to get a thematic Euro. Ain't going to happen. This is bone dry. But again, that doesn't kill the game for me. Longevity. Longevity hit and miss. With this one, you've got a lot of the cards, and you've got three separate decks, one for each era. Now, you'll go through a lot of these cards each game, but not all of them. So there will be new ones you'll see from time to time, but you will also notice that some of them are just derivatives of each other. You know, this one gets these two resources, this one gets these two resources. This one gets you points based on how many connected cities you have. This one gets you points based on how many connected tunnels you have. You know, there are variations, but they're not exactly the most unique cards in the world. They certainly get more powerful and much more interesting as you go into later eras. And, you know, if you were to expand this game, which I'm sure they'll probably do at some point, I think there's already an expansion in the works, to my no actually, to my knowledge, you know, there will be a chance to add more cards. More cards? Great. More variety? I'll be more up for that. The special cards that you can go after are a bit more better on that regard, because the level 1 and 2s, you use them all, but they're shuffled together and you don't end up with many during a game. I mean, we played one game and I think we drew two of those, max. And, you know, there's a lot of them in there, so you could end up with some pretty unique special cards. I just wish there was more than, like, one or two ways in the game to actually draw a special card. It's, like, so hard to get those special cards that it's kind of like, do I really want it? And the end game scoring ones, you pick six out of a bunch, and the rest go back in the box. Now, these aren't the most interesting cards. I mean, one scores you for this resource, one scores you for that resource, one scores you for number of cities, one scores you for number of this. They're pretty generic, but again, six randomized every game. You've got an, a slight advanced variant to add some objective cards, so if you meet the criteria, you instantly get this. They're cool, they're randomized, you only put three out. It's a really easy addition, there's no reason not to play with them, to be perfectly frank. But again, you are limited replay value-wise by the number of cards in the game. The locations don't change. There's no chopping and changing of those things. I mean, they could do that in the expansion, but my god, your brain would burn like crazy if you started mixing those up. A bit like um, Teotihuacan, actually, it does the same thing. And yeah, it burns your brain in that one. In this one, it would just go to 11. But it's really down to those cards. You're not going to get through many games before you've seen pretty much all the cards in action. With maybe the exception of some of the era 2 and 3 ones, because A, those rounds are shorter, but B, you're probably doing more stuff with cards you've already got. But, you know, there's enough cards to keep you engaged for a while. It's not like you're going to be going, oh yeah, seen it, seen it, seen it. You know, you're not going to memorize these things. It's not that bad. But certainly, eventually, you're going to get to a point where you need an expansion to this game, not necessarily to add more mechanics. I think there's enough mechanics in this game as it is. You know, it's, and for what it has, it's not the, not entirely streamlined, but it's fairly smooth flowing. I don't want loads more mechanics in this game. Just give me an expansion that adds more cards to every era and the special decks. You do that, you could make a nice cheap expansion and you would increase the longevity of this like crazy. Why is that so difficult? Why does everything have to be added? I mean, I guarantee I'm putting bets on it now. Next expansion to this. There's going to be a new mechanic, new board or something. Okay, fair enough. More complication, but all right, let's put it in. There'll be more cards. Great. Love it. And they'll try to add a fifth player because somebody out there was moaning that they couldn't play this game for four and a half million hours with five players. Bet it's going to happen. <laughs> we really don't want it. I don't want a fifth player. Just take it out of the game right now. But yeah. And if you're a solo player like me, there is a solo mode. So that will keep you engaged as well. Nothing special about it. It's just one or two tweaks from the two player rules. Go in, try and get the most points, and I think build a minimum amount of cities. But again, it's cool. You get to do the card combo play. The game is mostly multiplayer solitaire anyway, so playing solo is not a bad deal. I've had a good time with this solo. It's been good fun. So there's enough to keep you engaged. There's enough to keep you, like, for the price, which is a bit of a high price point, I'll admit. I think most of the time you find this kind of in the £50 category, probably more so. Uh, 45 to 55 I've seen it usually retail. Uh, quite a bit. 
you know, for a bunch of cards and some, you know, chits and a few little domes in that, I think it could have been priced a little lower. Or if you're going to make me pay that much, then, oh, well, charge me another five, ten pounds and upgrade some of those components majorly, you know. But like I say, for what you get, it's a pretty good deal. So, Underwater Cities. Well, definitely an interesting game, this one, because Pulsar 2849 completely took me by surprise. I was like, what? I love this game and I don't understand why. Here, I don't love it, but I do like it. I find this engaging and enjoyable, a lot because it's tactical. And I think that Pulsar had that as well. I mean, you could strategize saying I'm gonna munchkin this and munchkin that, but again, you had to react to the dice. So it made it very tactical as well. That was kind of more 50-50. This one definitely leans more to the tactical side than the strategic side. But for me, that's a good thing. That's the kind of Euro I like more. I liked having to react on the fly to what's going on. Um, but, you know, Pulsar 2849 is simpler to play, it is easier, it's more streamlined, and I like the dice better in that than I do the cards in here, but I think the card play in here is good fun. Certainly, like I say, some people have compared this to Terraforming Mars. I don't quite get the comparison entirely. I mean, both have card com car you know, combo play, and one is about terraforming a planet landscape. This one's basically about terraforming an underwater landscape. So I guess there are similarities, but one is all about card drafting, and this one's more about card combo worker placement tableau play. I don't know what you would call it, really. And certainly, if you were going to put the two side by side and say, which one do you want to play out of underwater cities and terraforming Mars, I would burn terraforming Mars on the spot and play underwater cities without a second thought. You cut me deep, Shrek. You cut me real deep just now. Because, you know, the luck the luck aspect is prominent in both. So if you're a little bit opposed to luck, you're going to find it in Terraforming Mars and in Underwater Cities. So, you know, you're going to have to pull up with that. But I don't think it's too much luck that it completely swings the game in someone's favor. And you can mitigate it to an extent. And like I say, a little bit of randomness is not like the like the end of all Euros. You know, not every Euro has to be some 0% luck, boring monstrosity or something. It can have a little bit of randomness in there. Um, aesthetically, like I say, it could be a bit more pleasing, but, you know, a few sleeves on the cards and maybe I'll upgrade the components over time, depending on the price point. Not the cheapest thing in the world, but it's something that could be done. And again, more expansions, add more cards. It could keep it fresh in my mind. So overall, I think Underwater Cities is a pretty solid game. This is definitely one of my favorites I've been playing for 2019. Is it technically a 2018 game or 2019 game? Uh, it's probably a 2018 game, I don't know. It was released at Essen, but barely at Essen. It didn't get a proper retail release till this year. So I'll have to check what the Board Game Geek says about it. But so far, definitely an entertaining game. You know, this is definitely putting uh, Vladimir Succi on the map for me. You know, we've already had Pulsar. Now we got Underwater. What else is he going to come out with? I will certainly be interested when I hear about it. I'll just know to expect, hmm, an interesting mechanic and reasonable components and subtle theme. You know, that is a bit of a minus. I wish this did have more theme because building an underwater city network could have, it's just ripe for a rich thematic Euro with this theme setting on it. But unfortunately, this one isn't going to give you that. So if theme is a big thing for you, like it is for me, it's going to be a negative, but I say stick with it. I think the tactical card play element of this game outweighs the fact that there is no theme in here. And like I say, I know there's a lot of games where I rag on them saying, oh, there's no theme in this. It's a little bit there. But it's the fact that if the theme is non-existent, for me, the mechanics have to work extra hard to bring me in. This game does that. The card play mechanic brings me in no matter the fact that there's no theme. So definitely, if you're a fan of heavy Euros, this is one you should definitely check out. For me, it's not quite up there at the levels of Pulsar, so I think I would give this a solid 8. 8 out of 10, it's a very good game. Definitely one I'm going to hang on to in the collection. I will certainly be like, oh, could we play a bit of Underwater Cities, you know, providing we cap the player count at 3 unless everybody knows the game. I mean, that is the thing. With solo, it's good fun. With two, it's good fun. With three, it's even better. Four, it's just a bit too long unless everybody really knows what they're doing. And you must have that golden setup for four player to be worth it, given that, again, it is multiplayer solitaire, which is a problem for me as well. But eight out of 10, solid game. I look forward to the next one from this publisher and this designer. So that's it for me. See you on the next detail review. And remember, doesn't matter if I send you out into the waters to drown. 
It's nothing personal and it's only a game. Take care and I'll see you next time.